Let's get right into it. When it comes to basic probability, some of the hardest questions you'll encounter involve the concept of counting and combinatorics. Often, the strategy taken is to simply try and brute force through the problem, which usually results in a lot of wasted time and frustration. My hope with this video is to provide you with a framework that can help turn problems that might take you 20 minutes to solve into fairly trivial problems. I'll start by discussing the foundations of combinatorics and its application to probability, and then lay out a general framework to solve these problems. After that, I'll apply this framework to a few common examples you'll see, and finally, I'll use this framework to show how you, yourself, could come up with a solution to the infamous birthday problem. All right, let's start with the basics, elementary even. If I asked you how many combinations of outfits exist if you get to choose one of two shirts, one of two pants, and one of three sock pairs, then what would your answer be? My guess is that you're able to quickly come up with 12 as your answer by simply multiplying the different choices together. What you're doing there is called the fundamental counting principle. And to get a quick intuition of why this works, let's draw the situation out with a tree diagram. First, we have two branches depending on which shirt we select. Next, the end of each of those branches gets split into two more branches, representing our two choices in pants. And finally, those branches each get split into three, representing which pair of socks we settle on. From here, we can see if we add another pair of pants to our choices, then we get another six outfits, just like what would happen if we multiplied by three instead of two. Now oftentimes in these problems, we'll be choosing from the same options multiple times. For instance, say you're a teacher who does not care about their job, and you have seven tests to grade. Being the amazing teacher that you are, you decide to randomly assign each test a random letter grade, A, B, C, D, F, with a repetition. How many variations of letter grades can you assign to the tests? Well, making use of the fundamental counting principle, you'd simply multiply the number of potential letter grades, 5, 7 times to get 78,125. However, you could have also realized that you're making the exact same choice each time, and just as simply taking the number of choices and put it to the power of the number of times the event is repeated. One note I'll make is that it's always important to actually check that you're making the exact same choice each time. For example, if you as a teacher instead wanted to be yet nicer and give whatever test you graded first either an A or a B, then your answer would instead be 2 times 5 to the 6. And while this may seem obvious, it can be easy to miss. Another thing that will often show up in problems like these is that multiple events will occur that draw from the same set of things. Say you need to pick four sodas to drink from a pack of 12. In this case, you'll want to think of either permutations or combinations. For our purposes, a permutation is the total number of ways you can arrange a set when the order of that set matters. The simplest case is when you want to find the total number of permutations for an entire set. If we think about the set 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, how many ways are there to order the set? In this scenario, we need to make 5 choices about where each number will be placed in the set. So, for our first choice, we can choose any of the 5 numbers. Now for our second choice, the number we selected previously is already in the set, so we have only 4 options to choose from. Under the same reasoning, we have three options for our third choice, all the way to our fifth choice, which isn't much of a choice because we only have one number to pick from. Now, using the fundamental counting principle from before, the total number of ways to order the set 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 is equal to 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, which equals 120. And you'll notice this is equivalent to 5 factorial, and it's true that the total number of permutations for an entire set of size n is equal to n factorial. Let's consider a similar scenario. However, in this case, we want to find the total number of ways to arrange a subset of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 that has three elements. Using the same thought process as before, we have five choices for the first element, four choices for the second element, and three choices for the third element. So the total count is five, times 4, times 3. 
And you'll notice, our calculation seems pretty close to a factorial, but it's cut off at a certain point, instead of going all the way down to 1. We can represent this fact by dividing our factorial from the first problem by another factorial. The question is, what factorial should this be? Well, we are trying to remove the choices we are able to make when we are arranging the whole set of 5 elements, but can no longer, because we are fitting them into a set of 3 elements. In this case, we are making two fewer choices, and you'll see if we divide 5 factorial by 2 factorial, we get exactly the result we are looking for. Now to generalize, if the set we are choosing from has n elements, and we are selecting r elements from the set, we will start with n factorial in the numerator. Next, our denominator should be the factorial of the choices we are discarding, so we subtract the number of choices we are making from the total number of choices, which we can represent as n minus r factorial. With that, we have now just come up with the formula to calculate the number of permutations of a set. And you'll notice that this formula still holds when we're finding the permutations of an entire set, where r equals n, so the denominator will always equal 0 factorial, which equals 1, and we're simply left with n factorial. Lastly, a note on notation. You will often see NPR notation, especially on calculators. And this is relatively simple to understand if you remember that n is the total number of elements in the set you're selecting from, and r is the number of elements you are selecting. Another case we will have to consider when we're selecting from a set multiple times is when the order of our selection doesn't matter. In this case, we're dealing with a combination rather than a permutation. Calling back to the example of selecting four sodas from a pack of 12, here it doesn't matter what order we select the cans, it simply matters which are present in our selection set. To find the number of combinations, we first pretend that order does matter, so we'll find the total permutations of the four cans from a set of 12. This is a great time to pause and practice finding the number of permutations using this example. Once you've done that, we can use our derived formula n equals 12 and r equals 4, so the numerator is 12 factorial, and the denominator is 12 minus 4 factorial, or 8 factorial, and that comes out to be 11,880 permutations. To find the number of combinations, we need to remove the effect of having order matter. So ask yourself, how much larger is the count when order matters compared to when it does not? Answering this question, we consider how many ways we can order the resulting set of 4 cans, which as you know is simply 4 factorial. And now that we know the factor by which ordering the set multiplies the total count, we can simply divide 4 factorial out of 11,880 permutations to find that there are a grand total of 495 combinations of soda that you can draw from a pack of 12. We can use this result and our derivation for permutations to similarly find the formula to calculate the number of combinations. Like in the example, we will divide the number of permutations by the amount of permutations of the resulting ordered set r factorial. We can symbolically represent this formula in a number of ways. The first way is identical to NPR notation seen before, however instead of a p for permutations, we use C for combinations to give us NCR notation. My personal favorite notation is to represent combinations in the form of binomial coefficients, where the top number is n, the total number of elements, and the bottom number is r, the number of elements being selected. With both these forms of notation and any others you see to represent combinations, you read them as n choose r because you are choosing r elements from n total elements. Two special cases to consider are first, how many combinations you can make of the elements of a full set, n equals r. If you think about it for a second, then quickly you should realize that because it only matters what elements are present in the resulting set, combinations, there's only one combination you can get from the full set, the full set itself. Using the formula, we can see our intuition lines up with the math, where when n equals r, the formula becomes r factorial divided by r factorial times quantity r minus r factorial, and that equals r factorial divided by r factorial, which equals 1. Now ignoring how many times I just said r factorial, the next case is when r equals 1. 
which means you are selecting one element from a set. Think for a second about how many combinations you can get in this scenario. After a little thinking, you'll probably find that the number of combinations is equal to n. This lines up with the formula, and if we recall the first example I used in this video, of finding the total number of outfits given two shirts, two pants, and three pairs of socks, you'll notice that we're dealing with the exact same scenario, just multiple times. We're still finding combinations in both scenarios. It is valuable to recognize that even though the processes for finding basic counts, permutations, and combinations are different, they are not fundamentally different things under the surface. You are still just multiplying sequences of numbers together that represent selections from a set. While they aren't different, their formulas do make it substantially easier to solve problems than working from the ground up. However, in practice, it can be difficult to recognize what combinatorial object you are actually working with in a word problem. To resolve this problem, I'm going to provide you with a framework to find complicated counts. The first question to ask is whether you are finding a count or a probability. If you're trying to calculate a probability, then your first step is to find the total number of possibilities and place this value in the denominator of what will become your final value. You can skip this step if you're just finding a count. After that, find one possible outcome of the problem, and while you do this, pay close attention to what choices you are making to find that outcome. This is the hardest part of the process, however, I'll walk you through some examples later to hopefully make this process a bit more concrete. Of course, the best way to really make this stick is to work through some problems by yourself. Now, for each choice you identified, ask yourself, are you choosing from the same set multiple times? If you are only choosing one item from a set, then you automatically know you are simply working with a single regular integer. Next, ask yourself if replacement is allowed. If you are choosing multiple items from the same set and replacement is allowed, then you'll be using an integer to the rth power, where r is the number of times you are choosing from the same set. If replacement is not allowed, then you know you are going to be calculating permutations or combinations. If you are choosing between permutations and combinations, then ask yourself whether the order of what you choose matters or not. Now that can be a tough call occasionally, but with practice, it will become increasingly easier to tell in different problems. Now, let's put this framework into practice. Imagine that you have a regular deck of cards with 52 total cards, 13 types of cards, and 4 suits. Now, you come up with a highly riveting new card game where you need to pick out 8 cards, and if 4 cards are all the same type of card, and the other 4 cards are all the same suit, you win the game. For this problem, we won't consider it a win if there is overlap in the cards satisfying these conditions. So, the cards of the same type cannot count for satisfying the condition of having four cards with the same suit. So, what is the probability that you win the game the first time you draw eight cards? I highly encourage you to work through this problem yourself before seeing the solution, and then compare what you did or see where you got stuck. Once you've done that, the first step using the framework is to identify whether we are finding a probability or a count. In this example, it is obvious we are finding probability, and in most problems it is easy to identify, but it is also quite easy to forget to do the step if you don't do it first. From this, we know we need to find the total number of possible outcomes, which in this case is the total number of combinations of 8 cards that we can draw from the deck of 52. To do this, we can actually use the framework, but we will use it for finding a count. We can assume that each time we take a card from the deck, we can't select that card again. So, this will be without replacement. And, from the question stem, we know we only care about what cards we have in our selection, so order will not matter. This points us to finding a combination, in this case, 52 choose 8. Moving this to the denominator, we can now move on to thinking of what one possible solution would look like. We need half our deck to be of the same suit, so I'll pick the 6, 7, 8, and 9 of diamonds. The other half needs to be of the same type, so let's go with all kings for the second half. Now, let's break down the choices I had to make to get to this outcome. I first need to pick which suit I want the first half to be, 
I also need to pick which four cards I wanted to include in that half. For the second half, I needed to pick which type of card the four cards should be, and which four cards I wanted to include. However, this is trivial, given that we only have four options to pick from with one type. Now, let's go through these choices one by one and decide how we will represent it. For picking a suit, we are choosing one suit from the set of four suits, so we know that we are going to simply multiply the count by four. Next, we need to pick four cards of the same suit, and there are 13 cards for each suit, so we will be picking four cards from these 13. In this case, we are picking multiple items from a set without replacement. We don't care about what order these cards show up, so we want to find the combination 13 choose 4. Thirdly, we need to pick which type of card the remaining four cards will be. While normally we had 13 options to choose from, we need to factor in our previous choices of cards, and, because we need all four cards of one type, we can't use any cards of the same type as cards we picked before. Subtracting 4 from 13, we are left with 9 options for the type. Similar to picking the suit, we are only picking one type, so we know we can simply multiply the count by 9. Lastly, we need to pick the cards we want to use for the second half of the deck. There are 4 cards of one type in the deck, and we need to pick 4 of them. In this case, we are again picking multiple items from the same set without replacement. And again, we do not care about what order they are in, so we are finding combination. We will calculate 4 choose 4, which given your previous knowledge that the number of combinations of an entire set is equal to 1, becomes trivial to the final calculation. Now, I explained previously the intuitive reason as to why this choice is trivial, but it is still cool that the math and your intuition line up perfectly. One thing the student among you might notice is that this walkthrough is from the perspective of choosing the cards of the same suit first, and reasonably ask if our answer would be different if we picked the cards of the same type first. Now I won't walk through the numbers in detail again, but if we do, we actually get the exact same count as we found before, despite multiplying by different numbers. The intuitive answer as to why is simply that we don't care about which order the cards are chosen so we should expect that changing which cards we choose first will not impact our results. We now have our numerator, so putting this over the denominator we found previously, we find that the probability of winning in the first round of this game is approximately 0 0.000034. Now, let's apply this framework to one last, more interesting problem, the birthday problem. Imagine you're in a group of 50 people, and you all go around saying what your birthday is. What is the probability at least two people have the same birthday? That seems pretty unlikely, doesn't it? Maybe you're thinking 50 out of 365. Well, let's apply the framework and figure out just how likely it is. As always, I encourage you to try and work through this problem without help, and then come back to the video when you get stuck. We first check whether we are finding a count or a probability, and again, it is quite obvious we are finding a probability. So, we first need to ask what the total number of possibilities are. In this problem, each possibility will be a set of 50 birthdays. For one possibility, we are drawing from the same set of 365 possible birthdays, and there can be repeated birthdays, so, based on our framework, we will be taking an integer to a power. For this problem, it will be 365 to the 50th power, which should hopefully make sense based on your intuition with the fundamental counting principle. Next, we need to diverge a bit from the basic framework to call attention to the fact that we are trying to find the probability of at least two people having the same birthday. Why might it be difficult to find this probability explicitly? Well, for one, because the language is using at least, we need to consider every possibility of matches from having six different matches probability of all 50 people having the same birthday. As you might be able to imagine, this is far too time consuming to do, so what can we do instead? Well, why not find the complement of the probability of at least two people matching, and subtract it from one to find the probability we're looking for? This then shifts the problem to finding the probability of having all 50 people having different birthdays. We are now ready to start attacking this problem. So let's first come up with an example set to get a handle on what choices we are making. For the first person, we might choose their birthday to be June 13th. Then for the second person, we know their birthday cannot be the same as the first person, 
so we now have 364 options. Let's choose March 17th. You can see that we now have 363 options to choose for the third person, and this pattern repeats until we have chosen all 50 birthdays. Now, analyzing the choices we are making in this example set. In this case, we are choosing the birthdays of 50 people from a set of 365 birthdays, and because they are supposed to be unique, we are choosing them without replacement. That leaves us to choose between using a combination or a permutation, so does order matter or not? Well, each time we choose a birthday, that excludes that birthday from being chosen again for the next people, which means that the order in which people are chosen actually does matter to what birthday they end up with. This is the only choice we are making for each possibility, so we are ready to calculate our final probability. Using the permutation formula, we will put 365 factorial divided by 365 minus 50 factorial in the numerator and bring 365 to the 50th power into the denominator. We also need to subtract this from 1, remembering that this is the complement. In doing this, we find that the probability of at least two people having the same birthday in a group of 50 is approximately 97%. It's a bit crazy that you only need about 50 people to have almost certainty that two people will have the same birthday. Even better, you've now just derived a general formula to find the probability that at least two people will share the same birthday for any size group. All you need to do is replace 50 with a variable like r to give you the following formula. Finally, I'll leave you with a recap of the framework. First, identify whether you're calculating a count or a probability. Usually, for test questions, it will be explicitly stated that you're looking for a probability, and it's good to get in the habit of doing this step early. If you're finding a probability, then you will need to find the total number of possibilities. To do so, you can generally think of how many ways you can get a different set than the set you were choosing from. Next, you want to come up with an example set that fits the conditions you were looking for. The most important of this is to be cognizant of exactly what choices you are making while creating the example set. In fact, it can be good to explicitly list out each choice you identified. After this, you will need to go through all these choices and ask first whether or not you are drawing from the same set of values multiple times or not. If not, then you know you will multiply your count by the number of options you have for this choice. If you are drawing from the set multiple times, then ask yourself if it is being done with or without replacement. If it is being done with replacement, then you multiply your count by the number of options you have for this choice to the power equal to the number of times this choice is being repeated. Assuming it's without replacement, then ask yourself, does the order you pick items matter in context of the problem? If order does matter, then you'll be finding a permutation of nr where n is equal to the number of options you have and r is the number of items you are selecting. If order doesn't matter, then you multiply your count by a combination with the same n and r values as the permutation described above. The difficulty of combinatorics comes from the nuance you often have to unwind from these problems, including them. And the best way to improve your ability to solve problems like these is to simply practice solving them. In most basic probability courses, these problems are at a level where doing a good amount of practice will start to reveal general patterns that can help you quickly understand what a problem is asking you to do. To help you with that, I've included a few links to practice problems you can use to build up your skills and practice using the framework I presented in this video. I've also included further resources if you find any of the topics I've introduced in this video particularly interesting or want to learn more about combinatorics. I wish you good luck and thanks for watching.